Welcome everyone, welcome to the Leadership Lounge. Here we are in May's Leadership Lounge and I have three more marvellous guests joining us uh, today. So I would like to introduce you, we have Tracy Prickett, who is the head teacher at the Reddings Primary School in Hemel Hempstead. Uh, we have Dave Pepper, who's the CEO of The Mix in Stowmarket. And we have Richard Smith, who is a borough councillor uh, in Watford. So welcome guys, lovely to have you join us. Uh, Tracy, tell us a little bit about what is it that you do as head teacher? Oh, well, my day is very varied, as you can imagine uh, at the moment. Uh, initially, just COVID. Um, but as a head teacher, um, you know, th there's a lot of things that I get up to. I, you know, I've been a head teacher there for um, 15 years, been at the school actually 17 years. Um, so it's very much a, a family school. Um, and it's all about children, children, families, education, giving the best that we possibly can in a COVID time. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> nothing like COVID to, to add a few more strings to a head teacher's <clears throat> bow. So uh, great. Thank you for joining us today, Tracy. Uh, Dave, you are the CEO of The Mix. Uh, we've had some mix guests before, but tell us a little bit about what you do and what The Mix is all about. So The Mix is a, a youth work charity uh, and we do all sorts of, of youth work provision in our building and outside of our building. And I guess my role in that is to uh, oversee the performance of the charity and the growth of the charity uh, and to ensure that we have a cracking team. So building team, recruiting team uh, is at the heart of, of what I do. Great. So and in building and recruiting and making sure the team is engaged in your core purpose, you know, holding to account, which is the topic we're going to look at today, is going to be uh, a key aspect and doing that well to engage your employees. So great for you to join us, too. Uh, and Richard, you, you are joining us. I think you're the first councillor we've ever had. So uh, tell us, maybe a lot of people wonder, what does a, a borough councillor do? And is that the only thing you do as well? Thanks, Colin. Yes, yeah, so uh, I'm a Watford Borough Councillor. Um, I represent a part of, part of North Watford, um, and I actually got re-elected last week for my second term. So very pleased about that. Thank you. Um, we do a huge range of things, whether that's dealing with local casework um, for residents, uh, but also all the committee meetings um, in the council chambers, holding you know the the guys who run the council to account. Because I'm a backbencher, if you for want of a better mm -hmm. word. Uh, but in my other um, in my other life, I'm a sound engineer and project manager for a live events company. So um, uh, I'm all currently on furlough because obviously there's been very few live events. So uh, between those two things, I'm kept very busy. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And, and now we have a clear understanding of what borough councillors do. And we'll find out a little bit more about, again, how you uh, hold to account there and, and the key aspects of that. So you'll, you'll know, listeners, that each month uh, we explore a different topic and we've already revealed the name of that topic. It's all about holding to account. Uh, and time and time again, when I coach leaders, one of the biggest challenge for leaders is having the difficult conversation and holding people to account uh, for the role that they do or for a situation that maybe they have a part in. Um, but as leaders, we are actually the chief reminding officer. Uh, we're all about holding people to be aligned to the vision, the values, the, the behaviours of the organisation. Um, so why is that so difficult? And what are the key components that help us to hold people to account? How do we hold people to account for things maybe when we have no badge or title in something? Um, and is, in fact, that even part of the remit of a leader? And, and what is good holding to account? And what is bad holding to account? So I've got three guests. We've already heard what they do, but they've all got that experience, a CEO, a head teacher, a local counsellor. Uh, and so we're going to explore with them today what sorts of things can help us uh, understand what is good holding to account. And um, so we've already heard a little bit from you guys just in terms of uh, your role, but but how is holding to account a part of that? So Dave, I wonder if we could start with you. What what part does holding to account play in your role? I think I think it's fairly uh, central to what I do, um, and uh, at the heart of that is is clarity because. Um, my team uh, are working to a, a purpose. To, uh, there's a mission statement. Uh, we've got a clear sense of what we're trying to do. Uh, and we ain't going to do it unless we hold people to account. So it's, it's at the very heart of what it means to be uh, leading a charity. But that trickles down throughout the organization. So everybody has, who has responsibility for somebody else uh, needs to have real clarity uh, about what that person is doing 
uh, what, why they're doing what they're doing, what the actual doing of it looks like, so the person can be held to account. And, and I think that's sometimes feels like a big stick, doesn't it? But that's around um, being able to cheer them on, uh, as well as uh, I was going to say chastise there. That sounds much too harsh, isn't it? Uh, but cheer them on, as, as well as help them um, uh, face the challenges that uh, often we we see when we've, we're uh, involved in a project or. Um, uh, some set of outcomes that we're trying to achieve. Yeah. Dave, what I love about the Leadership Lounge is we can straight away get into some key components. So you've talked about the importance of clarity, that clarity enabled to cheer on rather than ch- to chastise. And we said we perhaps don't want to use that word chastise, but that key thing right at the beginning, get clarity. Where are we going and what's your role in that? And let's get really clear on that role so that you know, so you know what you're holding yourself to account to as much as anything. So some great starting points there already, Dave. So thank you. Richard, what about what about you? What what role does holding to account have to play for you, either either in your day job context or in your counsellor role? So I guess in the counsellor context there's sort of two parts so I am held to account by the residents by the people who elect me um, and not also my my area my ward but the whole of you know the Watford residents um, collectively because you know I sit in committee meetings that has as an effect uh, across the whole of the whole of the borough um, so you know when I'm out on the doorstep or we're talking to people or we're putting stuff in leaflets saying this is what we're going to do, you know, come the end of the term, they have a direct opportunity to hold us to account and say, did you do what you said you were going to do? So, you know, we have to be very honest. We have to be very realistic about what we say we can do and achieve. Um, And then the other side of that is when we're, when we're in the council chambers, um, you know, my party is the opposition party. Um, You know, we have to hold the opposition um, to account. And that's just about you know, being constructive, you know, no one's going to win. The, the residents of Watford aren't going to win if we're all bickering among ourselves and going into a spiral of negativity. There has to be constructive and positive outcomes. Mm-hmm. Now, we might slightly differ on how that is, and we have to agree to disagree. That's the nature of, of local politics. But um, it, there has to be a constructive outcome to it. Great. So, again, a real reminder of your your part there. And in one sense, we're, we've, we've begun to touch in your role around you have the badge because you're the councillor, but it, but it's this sense of that's their action, but I'm holding them to account. And you've talked about the in terms of that that web of actually we're held to account by the people that we serve, and that reminder as a leader in the sense that actually we should hold ourselves to account because it's for these people that we serve. So again, real real key reminder. Thank you, Tracy. What about you? Role as a head teacher, uh, what does holding to account? Yeah, it is quite similar, to be honest, um, because, you know, I'm a head teacher of a local authority maintained school, um, which means I'm accountable uh, on quite a few levels. So I'm accountable to the DfE. uh, I'm accountable accountable to the government because clearly it's public money and public money has to be spent correctly. We have to have value for money. Um, I'm accountable to my governing board. Uh, I'm accountable to Ofsted. Um, You know, I'm accountable to the parents. I'm accountable to the children. Um, So that's my accountability. But actually, you can't do this by yourself. I've learned that over the years. (laughs) So accountability is on lots of levels. So yes, the buck may stop with me. Um, and times my head is on the line. Um, But actually, it is about the organisation. So, you know, in a school, it's absolutely crucial that everybody has a role to play and is held to account for that. Um, So, you know, if we look at this on an operational basis, um, you know, that's through a very robust and transparent uh, monitoring schedule. Um, Teachers, the nature of teachers, they hold themselves to account all the time because they're highly reflective But there are some times when teachers maybe aren't highly reflective and those further discussions need to be had because actually, why are we there? What are we there for? We're there for the children. How many times does the the child get to do a year group Um, just the once? So what they get has to be the very, very best. They cannot have a year that's a bit off because actually you're accountable to that child because it is the child's future that we're looking at. Yeah. So again, that real key reminder again about going back to the purpose of what we're doing, what we're doing and reminding people of the purpose. So as you say, there might be some members of your team that perhaps haven't quite understood what this is all about or who it's really for. And it's that 
bringing people back and reminding them of the key purpose of what we're doing uh, is actually a strand that I think has come through through each of you as we, we've chatted, uh, which is really key. So thank you. Um, so what about, um, is it, it, we've used this phrase holding to account and actually Dave used that word chastise earlier and it feels uncomfortable, doesn't it? And I just wonder sometimes whether holding to account has actually got a bit of a bad press. So one of my reasons almost for talking about it today. So what, what do we think about that? Does holding to count have a bad press? And if so, why why do we think so? Any thoughts from anyone? I think it does. Uh, you're, you're, you're right, but it's it's probably how it's done uh, very often that gives it a bad press. And, and, I, and I think um, the recipients of being held to account uh, often, uh, so, so it's the annual review, isn't it? It's people... Uh, coming in with some sense of trepidation and fear that they're going to have their wrists slapped and 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 going to be told they haven't done a great job, uh, when when actually what we want to do is create a framework uh, which is encouraging for people. So if uh, going back to our our clarity comment, if if they're clear what they should be doing, uh, then we can celebrate with them. So so uh, I think the relational element of holding people to account is really important. So one one of the the values that we hold. Uh, to our client group, so that's young people, uh, is we be- believe in their intrinsic worth. Uh, well, if we hold that for our young people, we have to hold that for our staff team as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that needs to come out in the in the way that we go through the the holding to account process. So, so in one sense, it goes wrong when we lose a sense of we're working with people and when we build relationship and when we lose sight of the intrinsic value of the people that we're working with. So that's when it can go wrong and it can get bad press. So it's great, Dave. Thank you. Uh, Tracy, Richard, any other thoughts on why perhaps holding to account gets bad press? I, I think sometimes it can be seen as a, as a top down um, type thing when actually it works both ways you know you know when I've led a team in my my day job um, you know we have regular times when I you know we work on improvements and what's going well what, what, what we can work on together and then you know it's always well, how can I help you do that and what can we do to help you you know you achieve this target or do or complete this project so I think sometimes it has been you know a sort of management or top-down led thing when really it's kind of a two-way thing yeah, great. So there's this sense of relationship is really important. And when when you don't work together on it, that's when it can get bad press, when it's actually about me pushing blame on you rather than taking responsibility to as a leader. That's when we when we can lo- lose it. So what do you think we need to have in place before holding people to account? You know, we, we mentioned earlier on, Dave mentioned earlier about the importance of clarity. What else needs to be in, in place when holding people to account? Any thoughts on that? There has to be framework and and structure and and policies, because actually, if you don't operate within boundaries, um, then actually, how can you hold anybody to account? You can't. Um, You know, there has to be that um, core value, the vision that has to be in place, because if you then do have to have those more difficult conversations, there should be no surprises, because actually all you're doing is referring back to the documentation in which you operate within, um, because that's your establishment structure. Mm. So it's a sense of no surprise, because we, we all know what the vision is. Uh, we know what our role is. We know the structure and the way we operate. And if you've got that clarity of those areas, then, as you say, there's no surprises. Yeah. Any Anything else that we think should be in there? I, th- I think that th- there needs to be transparency about uh, all of the processes and and a sense of ownership from from the person who is holding others to account um, that, that that is um, – a really important responsibility because um, that that process that you're engaged in um, can uh, help somebody else to flourish, help somebody else to develop and grow. Um, so th- that mentality, I think, needs to be foundational to it. So process is really important, mm-hmm. but also uh, just a, a mentality that you bring. And, and Colin, you hinted at coaching earlier on. One of the things that we've, uh, we're in the process of doing at The Mix is equipping as many people as we can with basic, basic coaching skills, not just for the benefit of young people, but actually for uh, the benefit of other staff. So that in, in our approach uh, to holding people to account, we're adopting a coaching mentality in that because we think it's a really positive way to go about the process. 
Yeah, absolutely. And so, I mean, what we're talking about there is empowering people in the process, aren't we? You know, we've yeah. talked about being transparent. So there's not this sudden, ha look, and here is this, you know, process that you didn't know about, but I'm now going to slap it on you to hold you to account. So that transparency is important because if they, if they don't know it, they can't empower themselves to hold on to it. But as you say, this coaching approach, which isn't you've done this wrong, but it's about saying, where are we at? What's working well? What isn't working quite so well? What can we do even better? What are your options? What could you try? And it's empowering them. So I think you're right. I think having that coaching approach to holding people to account means they don't feel it's done to them. It, it, it means they feel that they are doing it, yeah. uh, which I think, yeah, I think that's brilliant. And perhaps for many people wouldn't necessarily see that as an important part of um, holding people to account. But it is comes back again to what we were saying earlier, when it goes wrong, it's when it's become depersonalized, when it's become top down. So actually make sure it's not top down, make sure it's actually encouraging it out from the people themselves. Yeah. yeah. So one of the things that we've picked on a little was about vision. We've said, you know, it's important to have vision in there. So how important is it? You know, can you get away with not being having clarity of vision to then hold people to account? You know, these vision, the vision, the values that you have, the behaviors you expect to resolve that. How important are, are those things? In a school environment, I think it's essential. I think it underpins everything you're there for because actually you want like-minded people um, joining your team. Clearly, if everybody's the same, then that's boring and it just doesn't work. Um, but, you know, you want people to be signed up for the same reasons um, that you, you're delivering for. Um, and in fact, we we had a vision values aims. It was fine. It was all right. But actually, when we went back to it and looked at it, we went, actually, that's not our school anymore. We've been through a, a rapid period of change um, due to an Ofsted visit and, you know, a requires improvement badge. Um, so with, with that, we, we made those differences. We made that change. And actually what we became looked different. So actually we had to go through looking at our visions, values, aims. What did we want to keep? What needed changing? And then a period of consultation, because actually if we were going to change that and everybody had signed up to what it was, are they still signed up? Um, and that was lovely. And we actually left a big whiteboard in the hall with it all on and everybody would write things as they go past to the staff room or wherever they might be going, just adding another comment. So actually it became a collaborative visions, values, aims, children, everything went out to the parents, real big consultation. So actually what we are now is what we are. You know, what, what, what it says on the Reddings is what we do. And I think that's made a huge difference because I didn't lose staff over that very difficult time of rapid change they came with me and we grew together and and that's sort of a testament in terms of everybody being accountable for getting an ri ofsted yeah so the, the importance then of having the vision everyone being clear on it but actually reviewing that as well because otherwise you're holding people to account for something that actually you're not actually doing mm. and that sense of taking people with you as part of that um Richard, what, what about for you the vision values behaviors uh, you know that clarity around that is that important in in either role that you you play? For yeah, this? absolutely. I mean, particularly from you know the the council side of it, people are holding us as councillors to a to a high standard than they. And you know, as Tracy mentioned, you know, it's public money that's being spent. So you know, when we're when we are being scrutinised and when we are scrutinising um, in a, an official context, um, yes, you are. You know, that council's got its its mottos and it's got its standards, and that's what we have to hit. Um, and, you know, that's, you know, it can be quite crystal clear. There's certain targets and certain things that you need to meet. So sometimes it takes away the vagueness and it can be easier when you've got fairly defined remits of what you're looking at. That can, it's not about taking the humanity away from it, but, you know, if there's a structure and a framework in place, it can make it easier to have those conversations because, you know, either the whole council voted that they were going to do this. If it's not been met, well, why? Let's have a look at that. Um, but, you know, fundamentally, you know, they're very high standards and, you know, the council has a vision about what it wants to do. Now, being of, of the opposition party, we, we're not necessarily aligned to everything that they want to do. So, you know, that's something that, that comes out in the council chamber and, you know, that's just part of local politics. Um, but at the heart of it, we all want what's best for our residents. Um, so on the whole, you know, that's that's the baseline agreement. Yeah, and in one sense, I guess even where you've got difference of opinion, that last sentence you've just said, which is 
we want the best for our residents. That is your collective vision across all political yeah. parties, isn't it? And that's yeah. the thing. You then hold them to account over. How is this the best for our residents? You know, And if it's in a school, how is this the best for our pupils? And if it's for a youth charity, how is this the best for our young people? And if it's a business, how is the best? This is the best for our customers, isn't it? And it's so that that it seems that vision for what you're after is absolutely crucial if you're going to hold people to account for it, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. I think one of the leadership challenges with with uh, this is we have to keep revisiting it for ourselves and for our people. Uh, it's very easy to pop it on the shelf. Uh, mm. And it still lives in us maybe a year later, but not necessarily in the people that we're leading. Uh, uh, and and particularly then that that trickle down to behaviour and and helping people to understand what those vision and values mean in terms of the way they relate to each other and the relay they way they relate to relate to young people and the broader work that they're doing. Uh, mm. So I think it, it is that dusting it off regularly thing that I know I'm guilty of not doing that enough. Yeah. So as leaders, we need to get our duster out regularly. We need to do yep, what Tracy's do. just explained. Get the whiteboard out. Get them, and just so it keeps <laughs> it fresh, isn't it? Because mm. That in a way as well holds us holds us and them to account just by yep. dusting it off, bringing it out, talking about it. Uh, for me, I think one of the best ways of holding people to account is this regular revisiting of it and is this uh, getting the focus on it, praising it when you see it. Um, yeah, I'll talk a little bit more about that perhaps later on. Uh, Tracy, for you, what does good holding to account look like then if i was to come into your school uh what, what would be your gold standard holding to account that means people engage in that they don't kick back at you and think you're nasty or anything like that but really engage in in that movement that you're holding them to account for oh. or do they just think you're nasty <laughs> <laughs> yeah Absolutely. Um, I've, I've had to develop me. I, that's that's a skill as a leader I've had to develop over. I've just I've been too nice. Um, and, I, and I see that now. But there's a time. There's a time and a place for everything. Um, OK, so I'm slightly uh, quite, quite quite quirky, slightly out of the box. Um, so clearly everybody has a job description within the organisation. Um, a lot of the job descriptions actually been written by in collaboration with other people, because until you start doing a job, your job description kind of molds around you. So it's a slightly different way of doing it. You know, you, you know, you, you're signing up to a model job description, but actually you're going to make it your own. You're going to personalize it and bespoke it within the realms of your role that you're doing, clearly. Um, so actually everybody has ownership in their own roles, because if you if you own your own job, then you're going to have passion and you're going to invest in it and you want to go to do it rather than being told, oh, that's in the bit that says anything else that we haven't talked about. Oh, OK, lovely. Thank you for that. Um, so it, it's about that. So I suppose in a way I operate a bit of a, a different for different. So when you're holding people to account, there's different ways of doing it and there's there's different different scenarios that you go in so for me it's about having the knowledge and the background and the understanding of of why we may be there um because there are things life does get in the way of school it really does and we have to respect that you know teachers people in schools work ridiculous hours as they do all over the place um because they do want the best and sometimes you know you do have to have that adjustment so you know it, it's about <sighs> You know, finding out that that why, and as Colin and I have done lots of work around this, you know, getting wise to align, because if we can align wise, then actually we're on the same page. Uh, we have the same vision and accountability just kind of comes with that. It's more organic because actually people want to own it. And it's about really sort of going back and going you know, what is the barrier? What, what, what has been this thing? You know, can, where can we go with this? How can we find this? It's, it's a solutions focus because emotions always come in, but we have to try and detach that. And it's about, you know, working with the facts, working with the evidence. What's happened has happened. It's gone. It's happened. Yeah. Going forward, how are we going to move that? So, so what I'm picking out from there for our listeners to really to, to, to almost hold as a mirror against the way they hold to account, it, it's first of all being clear on the purpose and aligning the purpose with someone. I love what you say. I don't think it's quirky at all in actually working with people to, to really the, for them to define what is my contribution, what is my role here. I, I think that's what good practice would look like. Uh, it's about the leader then understanding what the barrier has been, that this isn't necessarily just someone not bothering 
uh, and then working with them. And it comes back to what Dave was saying there about coaching them through how are they how are they going to contribute then to overcome mm. this barrier, and how are you as the leader going to support them? to achieve that process as well so yeah it's really important to fall over you know a toddler doesn't stop they fall over they get back up again they carry on walking and I think it's really important to empower staff to enable them to fall over dust them down debrief go again yeah so so we're just encouraging them to get back up as a toddler and take that next step uh, and help them identify yeah great thank you and so that's what some good practice around holding to account can look like is, is what it what is it not uh so richard uh dave any thoughts on, on what is it not i mean we've touched on that a little bit is there any further thoughts on what it is not to be so i think there's a there's a real danger um in holding people to account in uh, of micromanagement uh, that we, we just try and control the whole process uh, and it's the sort of my way or the highway uh, approach to leading people. Well, we know where that goes. Uh, and I think it's it's being clear that 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 we we're holding people to account for the outcome uh, and the process. That would be a way that I would frame it. Um, so here's what you want them to achieve, um, and here's some of the parameters for around how you want them to achieve it. Um, so uh, creating a freedom and, and, and a liberty. So you're not pinning people down. You're not you're not cloning people to do it in the way you do it or somebody else on the team does it. But yeah. uh, you're allowing them to flourish, um, to, to bring what they have uniquely to, to the process. Yeah. So there's this metaphorical sense where we've sketched the outline of what we want it to look like and we, we enable them to to paint to paint the picture and, and to use their skills in, in doing. And that's what it looks like when it's good. And when yeah. it's bad, it's when we're micromanaging that. And we're, we're literally doing paint by numbers for them and saying, this is yeah. exactly what it has done. And I'll go and paint it again. And, yeah. and that's disempowering. Yeah. Uh, and then they'll do it reluctantly. Yeah. Richard, any thoughts from you on, on that one? Yeah, well, only that I think it's not setting people up to fail. And I think that's, you know, about having those, you know, realistic, uh, ongoing relational conversations <laughs> about, you know, whatever it is you're hoping to achieve or hold someone to account to. Um, and that's where that kind of two-way thing, that, that culture of, uh, of regular touching base comes in. And just, yeah, be realistic and, you know, make sure everyone knows, again, back to that one one vision and one values, make sure everyone knows what that is. Um, and, you know, you're not going to be putting them in a position where they feel too much they're, like they're under pressure that they're not capable or they're not supported yeah yeah I, I use this phrase when when talking about regularly reminding people of the vision I, I use the phrase fill the bath by the dripping tap so we can tend to think great I've launched my vision we had this big you know party red whiteboards we sent out letters then yeah. and that's just like a torrent of water in the bath isn't it and then we know what happens with bath water it either drips out through the leaky leaky plug or it goes a little bit stagnant and it's this constant drip feed is important and i think that is equally applicable as you're talking there in terms of holding people to account if we are regularly just drip 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 on this holding to account it feels far more manageable than just coming at someone torrenting this sort of mm. and now you need to up your standards to this this regular drip feed this regular reminder mm. i think mm. is is really important um, and and i think when you're focused on that and you remind people of that you create what what I call the meerkat moments when when you're saying, oh, Richard, well done. You really did that bit for us. And you're praising the standards you are expecting, which is the flip side to holding to account. You are reminding everyone of the standards that are being achieved. Then everyone turns and looks at that because like a meerkat, oh, who's getting the praise? What's it for? Then that's what I'll focus on. Because so that can be another way of holding to account. Dave, um, what, when we have this good holding to account, you know, we've talked about a number of things, haven't we? Clarity has been really important. It's about the way you do it. It's about reminding, you know, yourself that actually you're working with human beings. It's about exploring it with them. It's about coaching them. It's about empowering them, all the things we've covered. When we've got some of those good elements of holding to account, you know, what's the impact of that when we've got this good holding to account? Uh, I, I think uh, I, I look at one of one of the teams that we've got in the mix, um, and uh, they have been led by uh, somebody who has just held that team to account really well. The the the, the, the two other staff members that they were responsible for uh, were younger, um, less experienced, 
uh, and uh, she shaped a project uh, that needed a lot of work in the shaping. So she had to bring clarity to herself and then clarity to, 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 to those that she was leading uh, and then execute the project. And she did it brilliantly. And the two uh, younger staff who she was leading uh, grew hugely through that process and have gone on now to, uh, to lead projects themselves or engaged in leading projects themselves. So it's that bit of, uh, if you do it well, you grow the capacity of your, your whole organization. Yeah. Uh, it's about that genuine empowerment of, of, of the rest of your team. Uh, and so she, she's held them to account. Uh, and I think along the journey, there were some challenging uh, conversations. But because of the framework that she created, um, those conversations were possible. In fact, they were even nurturing. Uh, they brought that young team on. And, and now it's a team that has gone on to flourish in, in slightly different ways. Yeah, I love that. So, so not only are they seeing the model of how to hold to account so that when they get those opportunities to lead, they also model that. But it is this sense that, again, when you've, when you've got the good stuff, they are empowered uh, yeah. when that approach is, is shown. So it's great. And um, what about when we don't have it? Yeah, Richard, Tracy, have you ever seen or experienced uh, moments when the perhaps hasn't been the good holding to account? And what's the impact of that on, on people or the organisation? Either have you seen any of that? Or has it all been smooth <laughs> wherever you've been? <laughs> I, I think, you know, one of the first things is, you know, automatic demotivation, um, you know, and real kind of can, can be hurtful sometimes when you get it wrong, you know, and it has, it has a very human um, effect and impact and, you know, morale or motivation, um, you know, can go down and that then, you know, spreads into the team and to the wider organisation. So, um, you know, done you know, done badly or non-existent, it can really have a, a, a moral effect on your organisation. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, Tracy, yeah. It, it, it just yeah it goes it just it just goes all over the place, doesn't it? Um, so you know the policies that you did have that nobody nobody adheres to them, nobody follows any of that. So there's no consistency across the mm. organisation. Those with the internal discipline who follow it because they do then get really cross and frustrated because yeah. there seems to be people not doing what they should be doing. They're not pulling their weight. So you then get fraction. And as I like to describe it, you then get, oh, so you're part of the dark side, are you? <laughs> so those that conform have moved to the dark side, along with the renegade colleagues who are running around creating, well, you know, black is white and green is blue and yellow is purple today. And then what happens? You lose your talent because those people who are, you know, very much internal discipline, very doing what they should be doing, going, do you know what? I, I, I'm not going to be here anymore. Thanks. Yeah. So they go, you lose everything, you know, where you've got that growth that you could do. Those people who are running the shop, so to speak, now, are, have, you know, have pretty much won. You're not getting what you need. Everybody's forgotten why they're actually there. And actually the core purpose of why there's also left the building. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, everything just yeah. falls down. So that's a beautiful picture you've painted for us, Tracy, of all <laughs> hell breaking loose uh, and, and kind of effectively everything going on. Your culture just becomes septic the way you've described that, isn't it? So actually this holding to account, which we were saying earlier on, can have a bit of a bad press if it's not used well. If, it, if we don't hold people to account, we end up creating a completely septic culture and we end up losing our best people and losing mm. our purpose. So Lord really of the Flies important. enters, stage yeah, left. Yeah, so, yeah, so really important we get this right as leaders and we get this balance right that we've talked about and yeah. so, but yet as leaders we find it we find it is difficult to, to hold uh, people to account so Richard is there anything that you see what, what is it that we find so difficult what sits at the root of it that makes it maybe a bit uncomfortable for some leaders to to hold to account. Any any thoughts on that? Yeah. So from a personal um, thing, when I used to have to do, you know, reviews for for my members of the team, um, we were a close knit team. We weren't a big team. You know, these guys we got on really well with. We are sat next to each other all day, every day, um, and you know, you become friends. And it it can become really hard then to have some of those tricky conversations about. Um, you know what what they could be doing better what, what i've struggled to see them get on with um so for me you know yes it's great to have a well-knit close-knit uh, close-knit team um mm -hmm. but 
And with that comes some awkwardness when you need to have those conversations. And I've struggled in the past with trying to with trying to strike that balance. Yeah, and so there's a sense, isn't it? Oh, what if I what if I spoil the relationship by mm. holding them to account? You know, we work quite well together. Will they take the hunt with me? So is that sense that are they going to take this the wrong way? And yeah. I guess it's bringing ourselves back to the stuff we were talking about earlier that we we coach them, we work through it, and we agree those principles together. Uh, and then it becomes less confrontational, isn't it? But that's a real worry, I think, for many leaders. Many leaders I speak to and when I'm coaching, that, that is the strand that, that comes out for them. Uh, Tracy, anything else that maybe leaders find difficult when holding to account? Yeah, no, I would agree. I would I would have to say, you know, holding, having those difficult conversations um, came later in my career um, mm. because actually they had to be had. Um, so, so, you know, nobody likes difficult conversations. Nobody likes confrontation. Nobody wakes up in the morning and goes, right, today I'm going to go and upset that person today. Um, the issue with confrontation in these sort of scenarios is that it's going to evoke an emotional response. Um, and you're either going to get fight, flight or freeze. Now, yeah. you know, it's OK if you get the tears because that's you can talk and work with that. It's when you get the fight and the the aggressive, angry responses to what you might be saying, and nobody likes nobody likes feeling like that. Yeah. But it's that's just their mechanism. So it's it's about how am I going to manage their emotional response? Yeah, and I think one of the things I found most helpful in doing that for myself is something called uh, the power of pre mortem. So there are two key things for me when I go into a, a conversation, uh, and one of those uh, key things is being really clear on the purpose of this conversation. So it brings back to what we were saying earlier, and the other is the power of pre-mortem. So uh, we've heard of post-mortem, obviously, when something's gone wrong, you analyze, well, how did this, you know, in a, how did this death happen? How did this all go so wrong? The pre-mortem is, as you go into it, thinking about how might this person respond? And then we're less surprised by those, those reactions. And so then how we structure the conversation, I, again, I think is, is really important. Um, so I often find if I'm having to have a really difficult conversation with someone, you know, we've tried all the relational stuff, but actually they've kept going wrong on something and I now have to have this really difficult conversation. I, I tend to find this approach works is I have to be really clear on the facts I need to be clear on the reason why and I explain why I'm having the conversation. So, you know, if someone perhaps keeps turning up to work late, it would be a case of that. I need to talk to you about why you were late on this date, this date and this date. And the reason why is this is how it impacts on the service we're giving to our customers. Um, so I'd like to ask you what you think you could do about this. Um, so it's putting it again into their hands. And then you wait for that answer and you explore that answer with them. And only then when you feel you've got some response for them, so they're taking it seriously, then I would offer, OK, so how can I help you then to do this? And then confirm and pull it all together at the end of that difficult conversation. But have any of you uh, discovered some things that, again, might help our listeners in those difficult conversations? Have, have you ever... Um, have you got something different that we think would be a helpful tip to, to the, our listeners? I think that structure that you've just suggested is really helpful, Colin, um, and the content of that. Uh, I, th I think the, the bigger picture element is often quite important as well. Uh, I think you hinted mm. at it there that they know where their bit sits within the bigger picture. So, mm. so you can emphasize how them not doing what they should be doing impacts the whole um, because the hope would be, wouldn't it, that, that they are team players and that they're wanting the, the team to flourish and that they realize that they're not doing their thing is not just frustrating you, it's frustrating other members of the team around them uh, and having a, so having a wider impact as well. I think um, owning your own failings as well. Um, so, you know, we come at, at this, don't we, with various leadership frailties um, and uh, it can sometimes seem like a, uh, a weak thing to do in a challenging conversation to own our failings. But I th actually think it often empowers the conversation if we just put our hands up and say, I, I think I got that wrong uh, and to, to be prepared to, to apologize for that. Yeah, uh, I think and what you talked about there, Dave, is that vulnerability loop, isn't it? Saying that actually I got this bit wrong. And when yeah. we show an element of vulnerability, it can encourage them to also show that. So again, that's that. There's quite a lot of power in that, depending on the kind of conversation you're having. But I think yeah. there is a lot of power in that to enable them to see, well, if you as a leader can own up for something and take ownership for it, then maybe I can do the same same too. Yeah. Yeah. And, and coming back to what Tracy said right at the beginning, I think uh, that that sense that that you as a leader um, having the conversation, you're accountable to somebody else. 
uh, and them understanding that that you have accountabilities is important too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're, we're almost at the end of our time together now, so it's almost good, I think, to finish on that that aspect, Dave, about how important is it for, you know, if we're holding others to account, how is it important that we as leaders are held to account? And and again, how do we manage that? And then, then I'm going to ask you for a top tips from each of you for our listeners as we draw it together. So how important is it that, that we're held to account? And, and what is how do we manage that then as leaders? Any thoughts on that? Well, everybody in the organisation is accountable. Um, and I think that transparency absolutely has to be there um, because it shouldn't be seen as all, you know, whistleblowing or what have you. It, it's part of the system. So, you know, as a head and I sit in with my senior team, um, you know, we have a, a very clear structure of what our meetings are going to be about. And we've all got things that we should have done. And if I haven't done something, then those the, the expectation is I'm held to account and said, OK, we've not made that deadline. Um, when are we expecting this from you? Yeah. Um, and actually, it's re- this is normal. This is what happens. This is just part of practice. So yeah. I think that's the transition. Accountability is just practice. Yeah, yeah. And, and and I think it makes us stronger and better as well. I mean, in terms of, I know, for example, some head teachers that, you know, your governors are there to hold you to account and they'll ask you questions. And some can find that really difficult. But actually, you know, they're asking questions that help us make sure, have we got this right? And if we haven't, mm-hmm. what's missing? And, you know, in different organizations will have boards or, you know, governance of some way. And that's a key, key part of it. Um, Richard, anything else for you on this one in terms of us? Well, only, only just that, really. It's about building that culture that everyone's in in the boat together, and that you can lead by example. By you know, yes, when you haven't done what you need to do, yeah, okay, acknowledge it, and how you react, then others will will watch. As, as Tracy was saying, and if you can take the lead on that, then I think that sets a good example and a good culture within your organisation. Yeah, so it's do as I do, not not as I'm telling yeah. you, isn't it? Actually, yeah, you you're held to account, and you you responded appropriately, so. Yeah, maybe I can do the same. Yeah. Any final thought on that, Dave, around us as leaders being held to account? Yeah. So, so I've, I've led four charities under so under four different trusteeships, uh, and I would say I've valued each of those in in different ways, in lots of, of, of similar ways as well. Um, and it's that sense that you're in it together, uh, which is I find really helpful. You are accountable mm. to them, um, but and. There's the sense that they've got your back, but not in a they'll defend you whatever sort of way. But actually, you know, together we are about a purpose here and 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 we're here to support your leadership of this organization and to try and help you to flourish in what you're doing. So seeing the accountability structure positively, I, I know lots of people who have have found their accountability structures disempowering. And sometimes that's because that's what they make it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I so I think one of the responsibilities of a leader is to make their accountability structures empowering, uh, because that makes it makes all the difference. Yeah, I love that. And there's a sense of mutuality in this. As you, if you're on a board of governance, then your role should be to hold to account in order to empower towards the vision. Uh, so if any of our listeners are on the boards or of of, a, of an organisation, it's about making sure that's there. But equally, you've talked about. As leaders, then, if we find it's disempowering, then we need to have that conversation. And how can you hold me to account, but in a, empower me uh, to do things even better? And that communication, a key part of it. Um, great. Guys, our time is almost closed now. So top tips from you for our, our listeners out of all that we've talked about. What would be your quick top tip uh, to share? So, uh, Dave, let's start with you. What are your top tips uh, or your top tip for our listeners around holding to account? It would be simply be to create an accountability a culture so that it's natural within your organization. Yeah, a natural culture. So I guess does that link back to what you said right early on around coaching and having that as a key part of that? Yeah. Yeah, great. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Richard, what about you? What would be your top tip? Um, keep it calm and keep it caring. You know, these are all people. You've all got feelings. Um, so let's start with that. And when we start the process. Great. Love that. Nice, little, <laughs> simple, calm and caring. No, nice little kind of uh, link there with the two C's. So that's great. Thank you. Tracy, what about you? Have you got some letters that match or what have you if got? If only, if only. So I'm about be prepared, um, rehearse what you're going to say, um, show empathy, uh, explain the why, and most importantly, be honest. 
Yeah, great. There's a whole range there. I think you gave us about four or five, but that's fine because they're all really good top tips. Yeah. Guys, thank you ever so much for joining us today on the Leadership Lounge. It's been an absolute joy and pleasure to uh, catch up with you and share this thinking. Uh, thank you also to listeners for tuning in uh, and we look forward to you joining us again next month for our next uh, our next enjoyable time on the Leadership Lounge. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, and we'll see you all next month. Thank you. Thank you.